After a lifetime of researching the dynamic and enigmatic world of light entertainment, I've decided to ditch my notebook and meet the people who inspire me. What makes them the people they are? How do they feel about the show business landscape in which they find themselves? And in a world where anyone can be a star, is there still a need for performers who have universal appeal? Come with me on a journey of discovery as I get a unique insight into Britain's favourite stars with a little help from my glamorous assistants. Yeah, well, I say glamorous, more like hazardous. And of course, we'll have a bit of fun along the way. The ever-changing world of British politics seems somewhat far removed from the enigmatic entertainment industry. Yet both walks of life form heroes and villains which are mostly determined by the British media. Former Conservative leader and MP of Folkestone and Hythe, Michael Howard replaced Ian Duncan Smith as leader of the opposition from November 2003 to December 2005 in the midst of the Iraq War, which eventually resulted in the overthrow of Saddam Hussein and the Hutton Inquiry. In 2010, Howard became invested in the House of Lords and took up his official title as Lord Howard, Baron of Lyme. I was interested to get his take on a varied career in British politics and hear his insight into pressing matters facing Britain today. Ladies and gentlemen, Lord Michael Howard. Okay, the political landscape has gone through a massive change in the last two years. As a former MP, how would you sum up Brexit? I think Brexit offers our country enormous opportunities. And I am very optimistic about our future. There were always going to be lots of um, thrills and spills along the way and a lot of bumps, and we're going through a bumpy period just at the moment. Um, but when, as I, I very much hope and believe that we will reach um, a pretty reasonable deal with the European Union, which will be in their interests as well as ours, and that the future thereafter will be very bright indeed for our country. Okay, uh, you became leader of the opposition in November 2003, six years into the phenomenon of new Labour government, under no illusion that the Tory party was out of favour with the electorate. How do, you make, uh, how do you go about making the party appeal to the masses once again? Well, I, I think that the party has made... Um, a good deal of progress um, since then and although in some ways in, in important ways the recent election result was a disappointing one in that the Conservative Party no longer has an overall majority we did get 44 percent of the vote which is very high it's the highest we've had I think since the 1980s if not longer and so I think the party is making good progress in appealing to the masses, but there's more to do. And the challenge facing political leaders always is to come up with policies which are seen to be relevant to the needs of the people of the country. And I believe that Theresa May is working on that. And, and I think she um, will over time come up with those policies. Okay, as a senior politician, how do you prepare for somewhat unpredictable nature of the political interview? Well, I, I'm no longer a senior politician. I'm a retired politician <laughs> and I am um, not really involved anymore in the day-to-day -day nature of, uh, of politics. Um, but when I do interviews, which I still occasionally do, um, it, it very much depends on what the interview is about. And if it's about a particular topic, um, I try and prepare uh, and make sure that I um, know what I'm talking about. Um, if it's on general things like this, um, I don't really prepare and just hope that I will be able to answer the questions that are put to me. Uh, talking of political interviews, you were involved in probably one of the most infamous political interviews on British television, where Jeremy Paxton cornered you in 1997 edition of Newsnight. In retrospect, what did uh, what effect did you uh, this have on your political career? Uh, well, in, in 
it didn't help, obviously, in the immediate context, because I was at the time standing for the leadership of the Conservative Party. Um, but in some ways, it, it, it did help because um, it meant that I didn't become leader, or at least it contributed to the fact that I didn't become leader of the Conservative Party in 1997. Um, and William Hague, who did become leader in 1997, had a pretty thankless task of it for the four years during which he was leader. Whereas I think 2003, when we were beginning, we had the prospect of some improvement, was a much better time to become leader of the party. And we did make, I, th I think we made more progress in the two years in which I was leader um, than in the four years in which William was leader. And that was because it was a better time to become leader. So in some ways it helped. On the same subject, did you threaten to overrule Derek Lewis? No. Who was more gruelling, David Frost or Jeremy Paxton? I, th they were both um, very expert interviewers, although they had very diff diff completely different techniques. Jeremy Paxman tries to unsettle the person he's interviewing from the beginning and have very often asks a kind of trick question and then thinks that he's in the ascendancy. David Frost did it in a completely different way. He would ask a series of very easy questions and lull you into a false sense of security and then come up with a killer question when he'd got you relaxed. <laughs> so it was a very different technique, but they were both very expert interviewers. Uh, you were the leader of the opposition around the period of the Hutton inquiry. In your opinion, how far did this go to damaging the BBC? It did, it did some damage to the BBC, but not, I think, a huge amount. Um, I think if you look at it in retrospect, although the Hutton report didn't really make this out, but since then we've had the, uh, uh, we've had subsequent reports, um, uh, including the very big report into the Iraq war. And I think that it's all done much more damage to the reputation of uh, Mr. Blair than it has to the reputation of the BBC. Uh, in your opinion, should politics and popular culture ever mix? I'm thinking of people like Boris. Uh, what's your take on the era of the superstar politician? Well, I don't think um, you can necessarily separate the two because politics is part of our culture. And so I don't think you can draw hard and fast lines between politics and politicians on the one hand and the general culture on the other hand, because I think they are obviously intimately related and in a sense part of the same thing. Um, we don't yet know um, what Boris's career is going to be like over the next few years. We don't know what lies in store. Um, so it's far too early to make a judgment on Boris. But on the generality of the question you ask, I think that politics and politicians and the general culture will always be part of the same thing. Uh, looking back over your career, what is your passion? proudest achievement? Well, the, there are two things, um, I think, that I... Well, perhaps I can be presumptuous enough to mention three things. The first was when I was Environment Secretary, I'll take them in order of time. When I was Environment Secretary, I was sent to Washington to persuade the administration of President George Bush Sr., to sign up to the Climate Change Convention at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, which was the first international agreement on climate change. And I did persuade, and it, it would not have been a very significant step if the Americans hadn't signed. And I did persuade the Americans to sign, 
And so I had, I think, quite a significant contribution to the first international agreement on climate change. And so I think that's an achievement that I'm quite proud of. Then next, when I was Home Secretary, I was told that nothing could be done to present to prevent the inevitable rise in crime, which had taken place over the previous 50 years, and I was told would continue. I was told there was nothing I could do about it. But together with the police and others, we did change the system quite significantly. And as a result, crime started falling, um, fell by 18% during my four years as Home Secretary. And it's fallen pretty well ever since. There's some increase in the latest figures, but in um, over the whole period, it's fallen ever since. And I think the changes I made had something to do with that. And then thirdly and finally, although obviously I didn't win the 2005 election, so in a sense I failed as leader of the party, in another sense we made a lot of progress. We, we won more seats than... Um, we, we were the first, it was the first election at which the Tory party gained a significant number of seats um, for 20 years. And um, in fact, I gained more seats than Jeremy Corbyn did in the last election, although you'd never guess that from the way in which it's been <laughs> spun. And so I think I created a platform from which David Cameron could go on to uh, become Prime Minister after the 2010 and uh, 2015 general elections. Um, last but not least, uh, what is next for Michael Harrod? Well, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, have a, I, I have a very um, full life at the moment. I chair Hospice UK, which is the umbrella organisation for all the hospices in the country. And I was um, lucky enough to be able to visit the wonderful hospice that you have here in the Isle of Wight, El Mount Batten Hospice, last night when they were holding their 35th anniversary celebration. It's a, it's a really outstanding hospice. Um, and so many of our hospices across the country do wonderful work. That takes up quite a lot of my time. And then I have a few uh, non-executive uh, directorships which keep me busy. And my wife and I travel quite a lot. And so I have no complaints. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time. Not at all. My pleasure. Thank you very much to our guests for being the subject to another Beyond the Title interview. If you like this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything that takes your fancy. Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates on forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time for another Beyond the Title interview.